guys, it's Emma and I'm back today for you with another video and today we're doing my December 2023 wrap up. It is January the 2nd, the day that I'm filming this and it's a new year and I am just going to be talking all about the books that I have to talk about for you guys that I read in December. So before we actually start, I would really, really appreciate it if you guys would go down to the description box and look at all the links that I have there for you guys about stuff going on in the world right now. For example, the genocide going on in Gaza, the slavery going on in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the war going on in Sudan, and amongst other things, okay? So all of those things will be down there. And in the comment section, let me know whether or not you read any of these books, whether you plan to read any of these books, whether you didn't like these books, whether you liked them, everything of the sort. Okay, so with that being said, let's just get right into it. All right, so the first book that I read in December was Against the Loveless World by Susan Abulhawa. This follows our main character, Nahar. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. If I'm not, I apologize. Um, and she is in solitary confinement in, a, um, in an Israeli prison. And she is essentially recounting all of the events that happened to her being put in prison. Um, and I gave this four stars. The two things that I really, really love about this book that stand out to me from this book are Nahar herself and the writing. All right, the writing was so smooth. It carried me through this book. I just flew through it. All right, and then the main character, I loved her. All right, she was a blast to read about, quite honestly. Um, she was so flawed, yet at the same time, she, she, I don't, it, she was just so human. And I really, really liked that about her. I think my biggest gripe though with this book, the reason why it's not five stars is the fact that um, the timeline is a little confusing, or at least it was for me to follow. Um, as we get through the book, Nahar joins the Palestinian resistance. And, um, you know, we follow her as she plans out these like tiny little um, obstructions to the settlements. And then a lot of those like bigger events that happen that um, Nahar has a part in uh, are mentioned maybe like two, three days after they happen. So the timeline is a little confusing because now I'm like, okay, well, wait a minute, where exactly are we in the story right now? So I really enjoyed this book. I do think it does have some problems here and there, but overall this was heartbreaking. It was heart wrenching. All right, and it was really enlightening as someone who unfortunately doesn't know that much but is trying to learn more about what exactly is going on between Israel and Palestine. This was a very influential read for me and I think it should be for everybody, especially if you are interested in learning like me about what exactly is going on. These next two books, I didn't read them one right after the other, but because they are in the same series, I'm gonna just list them one right after the other. Uh, and they are Gangsta Volumes 2 and 3, okay? I loved these. Volume two, I gave five stars, and then volume three, I gave four stars. Uh, volume two was, I think, so much more helpful for us, like, in regards to finding out exactly what the characters are like. Um, this volume, I feel like, was so much more humanizing for Warwick and Allie. We see just exactly what's going on with Allie's um, addiction and her going through withdrawal and then how exactly Warwick deals with what his job is. And then volume three um, was much darker. Wow! Just the amount of stuff that we find out occurred when Nick and Warwick first meet one another and you know what happened to them when they were children is wild, okay? Like, I really, really enjoyed Volume 3. Maybe not as much as Volume 2 and f 1 on probably like a technical standpoint because I feel like Volume 3 was a little bit more confusing to follow. Nevertheless, I loved both of these and I cannot wait to continue the series. Next is You Made a Fool of Death with Your Beauty by Aquakia Mezzi. This is about um, a girl named Faye and she... Uh, is not interested in a relationship until she gets into... What would you even call it? She gets to dating this dude and she goes like on vacation with him to, uh, you know, his island house uh, where his dad lives and she may or may not start something with his dad. So it's messy, okay? Um, I gave this two stars. Look, I thought I was here for the mess. This type of mess, I'm just not, okay? Um, I like the whole thing of boyfriend's dad. It's intriguing to me, but 
there has to be conditions met. For example, the dad, there has to be some sort of hesitation from the dad about him possibly ruining the relationship between him and his son. Because why are you so gung-ho about getting with your child's former or present significant lover? Why are you so gung-ho about this relationship possibly being shattered? I also think that this book is the first that I've read that includes the boyfriend's dad trope where she is actively still with the with the son um like like with the boyfriend and yeah you know i guess they weren't technically together you went on dates with the dude you went on dates with the dude you you cheated on the boy he may not have been your boyfriend but you were i th I thought it was cheating. So that was kind of, mm, for me, I'm not a fan of cheating. I just don't like it. So those two things were kind of the biggest for me. That was why I didn't really like the mess, okay? Because the dad just seemed way too gung-ho about it, which we'll get into in a little bit. And then um, just the cheating aspect was a little bit icky for me. But in regards to like the dad, the dad pissed me off. Okay, because the entire time he's like, oh, no, 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 no. We'll talk later to my son that you and I are in bed together. We'll talk to him later about it. I, I, I have so much confidence in my children that my children won't be pissed about me essentially backstabbing my son and sleeping with his girlfriend or his girlfriend, right? Um, meanwhile, Fahey, the entire time, she's the one that is more concerned about their relationship. She's the one that ends up breaking it up. Pretty much every single time which is wild to me how does your mistress essentially care more about your children's feelings than you do all right no this whole thing was just it, it just dissolved all right by the end of it and i was kind of just reading it to finish it at that, at that point house of hunger by alexis henderson all right this book is about marion who has been raised in the slums and she wants out and she lives in a world where uh the people in the north they like drink blood and they hire women to be blood maids so that you know they can like drink their blood or whatever and the blood maids live a life of lavish okay and marion one day she's like you know what let me just be a blood maid so marion becomes a blood maid and uh she travels up to the uh countess whose house she has been signed under the house of hunger and uh she essentially learns exactly what is expected of a blood maid and all of the situations that happen in terms of love, sacrifice, and envy that happen in the world of the Blood Maids. I gave this three stars. I enjoyed it. It's not my favorite book of the year. It's also not my least favorite book of the year. This book is labeled under vampires. Are they actually vampires? The entire time that was kind of an iffy thing for me. I'm like, okay, so are they vampires or not? Can we just, so th mm, that off of my chest. Um, I loved the horror aspect. The horror aspect was really, really cool. And it kind of added this like jarring uh, emotional tactic in the writing because, you know, Marion gets to the house of hunger and she's like, oh my gosh, all this food is more food than I've ever seen in my life. Oh my gosh, these, this jewelry, these clothes, the, the heat, <laughs> the heat, the indoor heating. Okay. Just the entire time she's kind of spellbound by it all. And then all of a sudden the reality sets in of what exactly she's been brought here to do. And normally I would kind of criticize how jarring that is, but in this aspect, especially because it's Gothic and there's like all of those Gothic uh, pretenses around it, I really enjoyed it. The first half of this book I have to say is my favorite. The second half, however, has a ton of inconsistencies in regards to the plot. It dissolved honestly into some of the characters, if not most of them, just making idiotic slasher movie-esque decisions, which personally, I don't like slasher movies. It's not really fun. I know they're all gonna die. You know, I don't wanna watch people make stupid decisions. That's not fun for me. That's not entertaining. It's just annoying, all right? And it was annoying in this book to see the main character pick up a weapon, use it once, the villains on the ground, drop the weapon and run away. That makes no sense to pick up the fire poker, girl. Run with the piece of wood. Run with the two by four. That'll make... <sighs> and then the whole thing with like, 
are they or are they not vampires comes in. Overall, I enjoyed it. It was dark, vampiric, <laughs> eerie. It was gothic. I really, really liked the gothic setting. As a good time, I liked this book. The next book that I read for December was Light from Uncommon Stars by Raika Aoki. This book is a mishmash of, sci of science fiction and fantasy. Okay, there's a lot that happens in this book. We follow three different characters. We follow Shizuka Satomi, who is a violin teacher, and uh, she's made a deal with Hell that if she can give Hell seven souls of seven amazing violinists, then she can get her soul back and will be able to play once more. And she has set her sights on the second character, Katrina Wen, who is a transgender violin prodigy, run, like essentially running away from her home and just trying to find a place to rest for the night. Um, and then the third character that we follow is Lan Tran, who is secretly an alien, <laughs> who along with her family is running away from this galactic empire that they were once a part of that is now succumbing to what is known as the End Plague. I gave this book four stars. Something that I really liked about this book that quite honestly very much surprised me was uh, the very constant flipping back and forth from POVs. All right. We flip to so many POVs, like almost one sentence right after the other, which normally would piss me off, okay? But in this instance, in this book, in the stuff that happens in this book, it helped build up the tension. I loved it. However, one of my biggest gripes with this book is Shizuka and Lan's romance. The buildup didn't work for me. There was no buildup. Just like they went on two seemingly mediocre dates together and then just all of a sudden they're together and Lan is willing to like essentially face the end plague for Suzuka and I'm like where did this come from? I mean I like it but like where did this come from? Overall I loved this book it was so much fun just like Katrina herself, I loved her. I loved reading about her. I loved reading about Shizuka, okay? She's not a good person, but I loved reading about her, okay? I just loved this book. It was so much fun. I finally read Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. Uh, this is about a girl named Noemi who uh, goes to this house in order to check on her cousin. Um, and shenanigans happen all right she starts finding out secrets and uh secrets from old damp looking mansions are never exactly the nicest <laughs> okay i give this book one star the only thing that i liked about this book was the atmosphere the fact that this book was so atmospheric i could smell the damp carpet I could smell the mold in the air. I could smell, I'd, oh gosh. The first 100 pages, just how atmospheric it was, was phenomenal. All right, however, at the same time, those those 100 pages were boring. And the rest of the book really isn't that much better. All right, maybe that tiny little uh, middle period where we actually find out what the hell's going on. But even then, after that, it's so short and everything goes into chaos and not in a good way. And I don't know, Personally, I felt like I could poke so many holes in what was going on, especially like towards the ending where we were, you know, finalizing and cementing exactly what's going on in this house. So Noemi's cousin has married into the Doyle family. So we meet the living Doyle uh, relatives and we talk about a bunch of Doyle ancestors. And I really, really wish that there had been a family tree <laughs> just of the Doyle family, all right? I understand maybe not for spoiler purposes, okay? But just purely because there are so many people whose name is Doyle, and not to mention like the patriarch, like the grandfather, his name is Howard Doyle, and he's called just Doyle throughout the book tons of times. And it's, it's, it was just confusing as shit. There's one thing, however, that I am kind of 50-50 on. I don't really know exactly how I feel about it. The entire book, personally, I feel like can serve as a metaphor for sexual violence. And the reason why I feel like this is because, you know, the, the mushrooms, right? The mushrooms are constantly described as invading the body, pushing through the body, pushing out of the body. Just a lot of bodily invasions and sexual violence is invasion of the body. I can appreciate the, I guess, artistic choice of making this whole book, you know, 
a metaphor for sexual violence, especially in regards to like the colonialism topics that are every now and then brought into this book with the English mines that are pocketed throughout the Mexican countryside and everything like that. I can really appreciate that. However, <laughs> on the other hand, um, Noemi having to fight out of being raped twice <laughs> was a was a little much for me personally, but that's a personal choice. So I don't know. I just did not have a good time with this book. I was in such a vile mood when I finished this book. I was done to be, I, I was ready to be done with it. There you go. The next book that I read for December was another manga and that was Sweat and Soap Volume 6. All right, I gave this four stars. I think this has to be like my least favorite volume out of the entire manga, okay? Because unfortunately, Miscommunication decided to butt her ugly ass head in <sighs> to my two beautiful characters and just mess everything up because the bitch can't stay in her own lane. Oh my gosh, that I think was like the only reason why I didn't give this five stars and it's the only reason why I don't like this volume the most out of the whole series. Just why was there a need for miscommunication? Why? It literally doesn't make any sense. I'm still gonna read the series, okay? And I still like this whole series. It's just this volume I think is the weakest one for me. And then the last book that I read for the month of December was If Cats Disappeared from the World by Genki Kawamura. This is about a man who has discovered that he has terminal cancer. And then the devil essentially comes up to him and is like, hey, I'll make you a deal, dude. I'll let you live a day longer for every object that you make disappear from the world or that you choose to disappear from the world. He kind of has to decide exactly what it means to to live, to not survive, to live. And there's this whole, I guess, kind of subplot with dealing with grief because the character's mother had passed away from cancer. And, you know, there's the estrangement from his father and there's just a lot of familiar matters that are talked about in this book. I gave this book two stars. Technically, I hated this book. Subjectively though, the only thing I like about it, and it's so disappointing, is the ending. I wish the entirety of this book had been like the ending. I don't know if you can tell, but you see those wrinkled pages right there? Is these right here? Okay, uh, yeah, that's for me using this book as tissue paper, okay? Because this book made me sob. Very early on, this book just seemed like ramblings, okay? Um, constantly the main character makes these deep philosophical realizations when they really weren't that deep. They really weren't that philosophical, okay? They were pretty commonplace. In regards to who exactly was talking and when, that was incredibly confusing. Just the dialogue in general was a little confusing because I'm like, okay, wait, who's talking here? Who's talking here? Okay, so he was talking up here. That means that this person has to be talking down. My mind is having to do Simone Biles level mental gymnastics in order to figure out who's talking. And then there was just like a bunch of holes that I was poking into the like the logistics of exactly what and how he was making this, like these things disappear. I don't know, just technically this book was very annoying for me to read. However, the ending hit me like a truck. <laughs> okay, so uh, technically I really don't like this book, but in regards to the ending subject matter, wow. So you guys, those were all of the books that I read for the month of December. I hope that you've enjoyed. I hope that we will have a better reading month in January. I hope that we will have a better reading year for 2024. And I just hope that 2024 is honestly a better year in general. Okay. Um, cause girl, the state of 2023 was abysmal. All right. Just in regards to what exactly went down. Whew. Anyway, <laughs> with that being said, you guys, I hope that you've enjoyed. I hope that you will continue to look out for more stuff on my channel. I hope that you are staying safe. And lastly, I hope that you guys have a good rest of your day. Goodbye.